Now, get the 2018 Elantra for 0% APR for 72 months, plus 1,000 bonus cash. Hurry in today. Tonight, breaking developments as we come on the air. The FBI's stunning admission. They had been warned about the shooter in Florida six weeks ago. A call to an FBI tip line. How do they explain this to the 17 families who lost loved ones? Also developing tonight, the massive indictment in the Robert Mueller investigation breaking today. 13 Russians, three Russian companies, not only operating overseas, but operatives right here inside the U.S. And tonight, the American pleading guilty and who is now cooperating with Robert Mueller's team. Tonight, the new report involving then-candidate Donald Trump and a Playboy playmate raising serious questions again, the playmate allegedly paid by a tabloid just before the election. Why was her story never published? The major headline this evening when it comes to the deadly flu, the most children lost yet, reported in just the last week. Do not let your guard down what you need to know tonight. And the storm set to hit this weekend in the Northeast. And tonight, the rare EF1 tornado already confirmed. This is ABC World News Tonight with David Muir. Good evening, and we are just uh, back tonight from Florida, where this evening the president has now landed and where families have begun to lay their loved ones to rest. All of this as the FBI makes that alarming admission that they were warned about the shooter weeks ago. They'd been told he had access to guns and a, quote, desire to kill. Suspect Nicholas Cruz is charged with 17 counts of premeditated murder. Newly obtained surveillance video shows him walking to a McDonald's shortly after the attack. After dropping his AR-15, trying to blend in with the other students leaving the school, ABC's chief national correspondent Tom Yamas leads us off from Florida again tonight. Tonight, a stunning admission from the FBI. The agency admits they were warned about Nicholas Cruz six weeks ago, but they dropped the ball. We are part of this community. As this community hurts, so do we. The bureau revealing that on January 5th, a person close to Nicholas Cruz called the FBI tip line with information about Cruz's gun ownership, a desire to kill people, erratic behavior, and disturbing social media posts. And this, the potential of him conducting a school shooting. The FBI says the information should have been assessed as a potential threat to life but no further investigation was conducted at the time. We truly regret any additional pain that this has caused. The news sending a shockwave through this community. 17 innocent lives were taken from us because they failed to do this. They failed our school and they failed our people. This was actually the second tip the FBI received about Cruz. In September, video blogger Ben Benite alerted them to a disturbing comment on his YouTube page. A user with the name Nicholas Cruz posting, I'm going to be a professional school shooter. I thought that to be odd and disturbing. The FBI investigated but turned up nothing. And tonight, a new glimpse of Cruz from the minutes after the massacre. ABC News obtaining this surveillance video showing Cruz walking into a McDonald's shortly before he was arrested. According to law enforcement sources, Cruz told investigators he heard voices in his head telling him to conduct the attack. In the community where he grew up, neighbors like Shelby Spino describe a history of violence. You remember seeing police there at his house often when he lived near you guys? The police were in the driveway a lot. Police today revealed they received 20 calls about Cruz over the past few years. Several people telling us how he tried to hurt and kill animals. The first thing was the, the incidents where he had the gun and shooting the chickens. That was concerning to me. I thought, oh my God, of all people, I wish he didn't have a gun. Really alarming to hear about those warnings inside that neighborhood. Tom Yamas with us again tonight outside the jail where Nicholas Cruz is being held. And Tom, you're learning tonight about a possible guilty plea? David, we've just learned this information. The Broward public defender has just told ABC News that he's willing to have Nicholas Cruz enter a guilty plea in exchange for the prosecution to take the death penalty off the table. Now, they want to do this to spare this community a trial and even more heartache. David. Tom Yamas leading us off again tonight. Tom, thank you. And as we mentioned, President Trump is in Florida at this hour. He had promised to visit that community. He was headed to Florida to spend President's Day weekend arriving with the First Lady. But he also arrives in Florida to families, many who accept his prayers and condolences, but many who also are demanding action on two fronts, on mental health and on guns. Meantime, the funerals have begun. 17 lives lost, 14 of them students, children, Three of them hero adults, a teacher, and two coaches. 
I sat down with 12 students who survived, and there was something I've carried with me since, what they all said about their teachers, one of them whose hand was shaking as she tried to get them into a classroom and to safety. Tonight, a community, a country in mourning. The first two victims of the 17 lives lost are laid to rest. 18-year-old Meadow Pollock's funeral was held today, shortly after another service for Alyssa Alhadef. A talented soccer player and creative writer, her mother saying all she had to offer the world was love. Joaquin Oliver, who just became a U.S. citizen last year, Allison Torres showed me the image from her phone of Joaquin. So many remembering his humor, his smile. Senior Nicholas Dwarit had just earned a college scholarship. His friend Jonathan pulling out his phone too to show me Nick's photo. This is my classmate Nick. He was actually gonna, he was on the national team for swimming. He committed to the University of Indianapolis a couple, like two weeks before this happened. Great classmate, great person, always so nice. 37-year-old football coach Aaron Feiss beloved by so many. Coach Feist, he, um, he put his body on the line. He stopped bullet, multiple bullets from hitting students. So he was one of the most well-respected coaches, teachers, administrators at our school. Everyone loved him, and it's always a pos positive vibe. So just seeing him putting his life on the line for his students just shows how courageous one could be. He was one of several who put their students' lives before their own. And tonight, something that struck us, the students who told me every one of their teachers is a hero. Drew telling me about Miss Rubenstein, who kept everyone calm as they tried to get back into the classroom to hide, her hand shaking, trying to get her key into the door. I saw her trying to unlock her door and her hand was shaking. And at that point, like, I knew this wasn't a drill, I knew it was real. And we got in the class and she just told us to be quiet and she tried to calm everybody down and tried to like let us warn us about what was going to happen when the SWAT was going to come in and tell us what to do. So I want to thank her. So many of the teachers were the heroes in this because they were they either took you behind the teacher's desk or behind the file cabinets, one of you mentioned, and in your case into the closet. And what would you like to say to her tonight? Um, I would just like to say thank you so much. And she just wanted to relax and said I knew what she was doing and she I knew that she wanted to be emotional, but she couldn't for us because if she was, then so many other people would have broke down. And when you finally do get back to school, how many of you have teachers you want to thank? Yeah, the whole group. They helped keep you safe and calm. Every teacher deserves to know that they're a hero, even if it's not noted, they're a hero. And it is noted tonight, those brave students who want their teachers to know they are grateful and the students who also told me they want action from lawmakers. In the meantime, this Friday night, the major indictment unfolding today in the Russia investigation. 13 Russian nationals and three Russian companies accused of a massive effort to meddle in the election, and not just from afar, but they say the Russians were right here in the U.S. too. The indictment signed by special counsel Robert Mueller claiming Russian agents were posing as Americans. Their aim to help Donald Trump's campaign and damage Hillary Clinton's. And tonight, what we've learned right here the rallies, the campaign events planned by Russians in this country, attended by American voters. Here's ABC's Chief Justice Correspondent Pierre Thomas now. Tonight, the stunning allegations inside Robert Mueller's indictment that the Russians were not only meddling in the 2016 election from afar, at least once they were right inside. The group's alleged leader and among the 13 Russians indicted today, Yevgeny Prigozhin, a Russian oligarch with ties so close to the Kremlin, he's known as Putin's chef. The Russian operation expansive. It employed hundreds of people with millions of dollars. The Russians allegedly sent operatives to America, traveling throughout nine states. And that's not all. The Russians allegedly set up campaign-style rallies inside the U.S. in battleground states like North Carolina and Virginia. According to the indictment, this rally titled Florida Goes Trump less than three months before the election was actually organized by the Russians. Well, the Russians also recruited and paid real Americans to engage in political activities. American voters had no idea the Russians were behind them as they joined what they thought were real political groups, groups with names like Secured Borders and Heart of Texas. 
the Russian imposters were also connecting with what's described as unwitting individuals associated with the Trump campaign and other political activists. The defendants allegedly conducted what they called information warfare against the United States with the stated goal of spreading distrust towards the candidates and the political system in general. The question now, will President Trump still call the Mueller investigation a witch hunt? As recently as July, saying this about the Russians, that it could be someone else. Well, I think it was Russia, and I think it could have been other people in other countries. Uh, could have been a lot of people interfered. But tonight, the indictment makes clear investigators are convinced the Russians, who were working from overseas, came here to the U.S. And were launching attacks aimed at, quote, disparaging Hillary Clinton and supporting the presidential campaign of then-candidate Donald J. Trump. ABC News is Dan Harris at a nondescript building in St. Petersburg, where some of the Russians, part of Internet Research Agency, were writing their material to get Americans riled up. Our team obtaining a hidden camera look inside the operation. Okay, easy, easy. They kicked Dan out, but tonight Mueller's indictment indicates their work was already done. Pierre Thomas with us tonight. That was a telling moment when they did not want Dan Harris or our cameras there. And there was one other major headline uh, that broke today. An American who pleaded guilty, Pierre, and who is now cooperating with the special counsel. What have you learned? That's right, David. Mueller announced the guilty plea of American citizen Richard Pinedo from Southern California, who admitted to committing fraud by helping the Russians set up fake American identities, David. Pierre, thank you. Next, the new report of an alleged affair between a Playboy playmate and Donald Trump before he was elected president. The report in The New Yorker allegedly involving money spent just before the election for her story, which was then never published. Why wasn't it? Here's ABC senior White House correspondent Cecilia Vega. At the White House today, an abrupt change of plans. President Trump bound for Florida, boarding Marine One alone. The first lady was supposed to be with him. Instead, she left separately and met him at Air Force One. It comes as the president faces explosive new allegations about a nine-month affair with a Playboy playmate and new questions about whether she was paid to stay silent days before the presidential election. The New Yorker reports Mr. Trump met the woman, Karen McDougal, in 2006 at the Playboy Mansion, where he was taping an episode of The Apprentice. Come on over. Wow. The magazine obtained what they say is eight pages of McDougal's writings detailing the alleged affair, which reportedly took place less than two years after Donald and Melania Trump married when their son Barron was just an infant. McDougal writes that after they had sex on their first date, quote, he offered me money. I looked at him, plus felt sad, plus said, no thanks, I'm not that girl. I slept with you because I like you, not for money. He told me you are special. In 2015, at the time of a Republican debate, McDougal tweeted this old photo. According to The New Yorker, the National Enquirer, run by David Pecker, who calls President Trump a personal friend, paid McDougal $150,000 for the exclusive rights to her story. But they never printed it. Attention Journalist right, well, Ronan Farrow, who broke the story, exactly says the Inquirer's the motive election, was clear. Right. Uh, people in tabloid business call this catch and kill, and it's, you know, acquiring a story to bury it. Farrow's report claims the affair happened around the same time Mr. Trump allegedly became involved with adult film actress Stormy Daniels. This week, the president's longtime personal attorney acknowledged he paid Daniels $130,000 just before the election. Michael Cohen says neither the president's business nor his campaign was part of the transaction, but he has not said whether the president knew about that payment. Didn't Daniels, staying mom. Do you have a non-disclosure agreement? Do I? And tonight in Florida, the president and first lady walked off Air Force One together. And Cecilia Vega with us live tonight from the White House. And Cecilia, some pretty strong reaction to this story from the White House at this hour. Yeah, David, they are denying both alleged affairs of this latest one. The White House calls it fake news, saying, quote, the president says he never had a relationship with McDougal. The publisher of the National Enquirer says that the suggestion that that tabloid hold influence over this president is, quote, laughable, David. All right, Cecilia Vega rounding out another week at the White House. Next, the new flu numbers from the CDC tonight. 22 children reported to have died. That's the worst week of this flu season so far. That's more than twice as many as the week before. In fact, the toll of children lost now rising to at least 84. And look at the map tonight, a high level of flu activity remaining in 43 states.